And um, his mainly interests are with uh, philosophy of religion and a modern philosophy. And he will talk to us about the by the hand of my tongue, speech act and manifestation of the self in the world. First, I just want to say that was an excellent paper. And um, uh, I think whoever paired this, whoever put together this panel did a great job because they, the two papers do speak to one, one another. In that, my paper, too, oscillates back and forth, as it were, between Ricoeur's work in the 60s and, uh, to some extent, at least refers to uh, his later work in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, but I, I focus less on uh, the phenomenology of the will uh, and more on, on uh, his hermeneutical discourse and specifically the interpretation of symbolism of, of evil. Um, but after, in light of your paper, I've had to rewrite the conclusion to my own. So this is, this is uh, really wonderful. All right. <clears throat> more than two decades before he explicitly took up the ordinary language philosophy of Austin and Sorrell in One Self is Another, Ricoeur had already employed the theory of performative utterance in an essay dating from the late 1960s, where certain forms of religious expression, of course, a vowel and confession in particular, were analyzed as speech acts. The essay in question is in, is in the collection of Con uh, Conflict of Interpretation. Today, I want to argue that this early encounter with analytic philosophy was anything but a trivial appropriation of a then fashionable philosophical term of art. Rather, it highlights an underappreciated aspect of Ricoeur's early work on the will and foreshadows central features of his later work, namely the notions of attestation and narrative selfhood. Ricoeur's motivations for taking up the speech act theory stem from the same set of philosophical problems that had led to his so-called hermeneutical turn in the 1950s, namely problems regarding the empirical conditions of human fault and the challenge of providing a philosophical account of the origins of evil. As Ricoeur himself admits, the eidetic method of his earlier work on the will proved inadequate. For if the existence of moral evil is to be imputable to human, to human beings, that is to say, if it's to be something for which one is responsible, guilty, or at fault, then it cannot consist of a necessary, essential, or structural feature of the will as such. On the contrary, it must be a consequence of my empirical use of freedom, and thus an accidental or contingent property of my will. While Ricoeur was able to paint with a phenomenological, phenomenal, phenomenologist brush, it's a horribly written sentence, while Ricoeur was able to paint with a phenomenologist brush, the general contours of fallibility, defined as the possibility of fault, in the first volume of his philosophy of will, any treatment of the actuality of fault would require additional tools, specifically hermeneutical ones. In other words, since there can be no a priori description of a purely accidental feature of human existence, Ricoeur's project would need to make recourse to human history and to a hermeneutic of the concrete linguistic expressions found therein. This, of course, took the form of an interpretation of figurative language, the symbols and myths of biblical Near Eastern and classical literatures. My claim, however, is that this hermeneutics of figurative language was, from nearly its inception, informed or supplemented by an, or an analysis of ordinary everyday language as well, and specifically an analysis of confession as a speech act. In order to locate the place where this analysis makes its contribution, allow me to recall in the, the general terrain charted by Ricoeur's symbolism of evil. Ricoeur's hermeneutics hinges on a distinction between the primitive, uh, the, tr the primitive symbols, which depict evil as an external material substance, such as stain or defilement, and the relatively more developed internal symbols, which depict evil as an, an inner act of volition, such as a deviation or a wandering off a path. Mythical accounts of the origin of evil can be divvied up along the, the lines of this ex exteriority-interiority schema. The Babylonian poem of creation, the Orphic myth of the soul, the Gnostic cosmology of Mani, each, quote, take the origin of evil back to a catastrophe or primordial conflict prior to man, end quote. Whereas the biblical narrative of the fall traces its origin back to man himself, to a spontaneous and fully autonomous act of the will. On the one hand, evil takes a heteronymous form. It is a being that infects humanity from the outside. On the other hand, evil is a doing or, or a result of human freedom. 
The Adamic myth represents perhaps the paradigm for internal myths, or the paradigm of, inter of internal myths, in that it explicitly disarticulates or desynchronizes the beginning of creation from the beginning of history. It posits a rupture between the origin of the good, identical to creation as such, and the origin of evil, which is inaugurated by an empirical use of the human will. Recur observes, however, that even the most interiorized accounts of evil never fully dispense with the primitive symbols of evil's exteriority. Genesis, for example, incorporates elements of both schemas within one and the same narrative. There we find, in addition to Adam's inner act of disobedience, figures of exteriority, which, as it were, tempt Adam from without. Of course, think the serpent or Eve. In fact, from the perspective of humanity as a whole, Adam himself becomes the figure of exteriority. For in, in addition to the Pelagian prototype, according to which each person sins for himself, Adam is also, at least on Augustine's reading, a father whose debt the human race is said to inherit. Recur's interpretation suggests that this inheritance, which Kierkegaard, rightly regarded as the most perplexing feature of original sin, is nothing other than the residual expression of an irreducible feature of the experience of evil, namely that even before we act, before we sin, it appears as if evil were always already there. If, as I suggested a moment ago, Recur's detour by way of the, an interpretation of symbols and myths was intended to shed light on the actuality of moral evil, and hence moral guilt, then one might be surprised to discover that these efforts simply wind up bringing into sharper focus the limitations facing every attempt to express either in a figurative or, as I will show in a moment, a rational language, the conditions under which evil is in, indeed attributable to agents. For only an account that entirely eliminates the specter of heteronomy would, as it were, satisfy the conditions of possibility for the imputation of guilt. Or so it would seem. It is precisely at this stage in Recur's reflection when evil's exteriority reinstates itself or reinscribes itself within the biblical myth of the fall, that a way forward will require us to, to join his reflection on the symbolism of evil to his roughly contemporaneous reflections on confession as a performative utterance. In doing so, however, I want to stress that our goal is not to provide a theoretical solution to a purely conceptual problem. For if we were concerned with the practice for if we are concerned with the practical ethical problem of assigning responsibility, then our aim will be to mobilize our resources for offering a practical response, as the word responsibility implies. And this response, of course, will take the form of confession, envisioned as a speech act. And you might have guessed from the citation included in the title of my talk that the key figure here in Recur's discussion of confession is a certain Augustine, not the anti-Pelagian polemicist, but the recent convert, the recent Christian convert, the author of De Libero Arbitrio. This claim might seem surprising. After all, this was the Augustine that seemed to treat the problem of evil as a metaphysical one, and one requiring a metaphysical solution, namely the positing of a faculty of will. But Recur's reading shows that this li libertarian metaphysics is in fact rooted in a practical act of confession, in the wake of his conversion, Augustine needed to reject the Manichaean ontology according to which evil represents a natural or substantial feature of our world. For if all that exists comes from the one supreme and benevolent God who created the world ex nihilo, then how does one account for the appearance of evil in our world? Augustine's answer to this puzzle lies in his privation theory of evil, of course. Evil on this account does not, strictly speaking, exist at all. It is literally no thing. The experience of evil results, rather, from one's own misguided yet free choice to turn away from God in the direction of nothingness, away from the eternal being toward the temporal objects of inordinate desire. But what about the origin of this inordinate desire, this perverse propensity which Augustine's theory of the will seems to presuppose as an all-pervasive feature of human experience? The force of this question help, helps explain why his libertarian formulation of the will could not get the jo job done on its own, but rather needed to be erected upon and rooted in a confessional act of faith. One could invoke a well-known Augustinian formula in order to make this point. One needed first of all to believe that God is innocent and that man alone is guilty. Only then can one understand how the positing of, the free of freedom can make this so. So Augustine's confession of faith, 
his confession that God is the benevolent creator of all that is, etc., etc., necessitates a confession of sin. I am responsible for evil, which in turn grounds Augustine's libertarian account of the will, my evil, my responsibility, and thus my free initiative. Seen in this light, the positing of free will and the avowal of sin constitute, constitute two interconnected pillars of Augustine's anti-Manichaean theodicy. Taken together, they serve as the logically necessary corollaries of believing God to be God rather than an architect of evil. Recur makes this point explicit in his essay, Guilt, Ethics, and Religion. Quote, to affirm freedom is to take upon oneself the origin of evil. If the heteronymous origin of evil threatened to undermine the possibility of imputation, then this threat is to be countered by a linguistic act of affirmation, not by some metaphysical conception of will. By the way, that wasn't all, that wasn't all part of Recur, that, just the first half of that sentence. Sorry. Now I'm about to quote him. Uh, quote, to take upon oneself the origin of evil is to lay aside as a weakness the claim that evil is something that it is an effect in a world of observable things. But this, quote, solution, which cancels at once all conceptions of evil's exteriority, resides in a practical act of confession. To take, this is the quote recur, quote, to take evil upon oneself is an act of language comparable to the performative, in the sense that it is a language which does something. That is to say, it imputes the act to me, end quote. I'd like to highlight briefly three important consequences of thinking of confession as a speech act. First, confession appears to move along two trajectories. On the one hand, the confession serves as a commissive. It commits the speaker to live in accordance with certain moral or theological belief content, thereby directing us towards a future in which this commitment or promise can be kept. On the other hand, confession bears a clear relation to the past. For example, in juridical contexts, where the confessor owns up to a crime already committed. Our reading of Augustine demonstrates that these two temporal horizons are perfectly commensurable. In owning up to the actions that occur to the past, the penitent is also publicly committing herself to a certain future, offering herself up as the one who must bear the future consequences of those past actions. In this light, then, it's hardly surprising to find that Augustine's adoption of a certain confession, his commitment to the Christian understanding of God, would be an inextricably linked to a confession of sin. But Recur's analysis adds a third temporal modality. Quote, the two, the two dimensions, future and past, are linked in the present. The future of sanction and the past of action committed are tied together in the present of confession, end quote. Now, if for Augustine, the distensio, or dispersion of the soul across time, is a consequence of our post-lapsarian natures, then the process of narration involved in the act of confession serves to reconfigure the fragmented soul into an integrated whole. In passages that foreshadow later discussions of narrative selfhood, uh, his later discussions of narrative selfhood, Recur claims that the speech act serves to configure the, quote, identity of the moral subject through past, present, and future, end quote. In short, they attest to the unity of self, an issue whose subtleties were so nicely treated earlier today by our colleague Robert. Second point. In keeping with speech act theory, confession must not be mistaken for a constantive utterance or a propositional statement intended to convey meaning about some state of affairs anterior to the speech act itself. After all, since the imagined interlocutor is, for Augustine at least, an omniscient being, the need to communicate propositional content is ruled out in advance. And Recur writes, quote, the conviction of having done something freely is not a matter of observation. It is once again a performative. I declare myself after the fact as, be as, as a being who could have done otherwise. This after the fact is the backlash of taking upon oneself the consequences. This movement from in front to behind the responsibility is essential, end quote. It's a remarkable statement on Recur's part, as it suggests a complete reversal of the conventional view regarding the relationship between freedom and responsibility. The view according to which freedom is said to constitute responsibility, uh, resp freedom is said to constitute responsibility's condition of possibility. But on Recur's account, 
Hol- the, the holy linguistic act of taking responsibility for a past serves to ground freedom itself. As ordinary language so often attests, responsibility is, after all, something we take on, as when we say, for example, uh, I've taken on greater responsibilities. If initiative really amounts to reclaiming uh, a, pa- a past deed, which is always already accomplished, then we might say that there is no doing before there is doing with words, or nothing is done until something is done with words. Freedom does not precede the speech act, but is born of it. The third point follows from the second. The act of confession, understood here as a verbal attestation of the capable self, serves to fill on the ethical plane what amounts to an inescapable lacuna on the theoretical plane. Philosophical discourse on freedom and the origin of evil are constrained by the very same limitations that faced mythical depictions of the fall, and so they too fail in their effort to provide a purely rational account of the conditions under which evil is imputable to agents. This problem can be spelled out in any number of ways. Take, for, exi- uh, for, for instance, the paradoxes generated by the insatiable demand for an absolute self-determining cause, the dream of a metaphysical freedom that would provide rational ground for our ordinary practices of holding people responsible for what they do. Allow me to quickly elaborate these paradoxes. Every supposedly free action takes place against a backdrop of seemingly countless unchosen facts about ourselves, contingent facts about our beliefs, desires, principles, in short, our natures. In order for my action to be free in the superlative metaphysical sense, they would need to be caused by something in me that is prior or deeper to, uh, deeper than these contingent features of myself, something beyond or behind these beliefs and desires, something that, that, might, something that might somehow account for my having freely adopted certain principles over others or for my having acted on a desire rather than not. It is then tempting to posit still deeper principles, principles that would supposedly be far more constitutive of who I am than the first order principles which had immediately and thus only ostensibly determined my action. But of course these second order principles or these principles for the adoption of principles um, will also demand some account in terms of motives. Otherwise my choice of them would be totally arbitrary and thus no choice at all. Recur writes elegantly and in various contexts about this, quote, harassing backward flight of thought in search of first principles, end quote. One of the most striking, and for our present purposes, most pertinent examples of this recursive procedure can be found in Kant's religion within the boundaries of mere reason, where the effort to prevent the exercise of freedom from being traced back to natural causes, inclinations and the like, precipitates Kant's withdrawal into the inscrutable depths of the noumenal, Since, on Kant's account, the ground of freedom, quote, must not be sought in any incentive of nature, we are endlessly referred back in a series of subjective determining grounds without ever being able to come to the first ground, end quote. To be sure, Kant is able to salvage some form of freedom, a so-called intelligible freedom, but this freedom is purchased at the price of its utter intelligibility. And here I'm not just being ironic, this is quite literally the case, right? This is inscrutable. Having run up against the epistemological limits of his critical philosophy, Kant finally breaks off the search. In in a passage quoted with great interest by Recur, Kant writes, in the search for the rational ground of, uh, yeah, sorry, this is a quote from Kant. In the search for the rational origin of evil actions, every such action must be regarded as though the individual had fallen into it directly from a state of innocence, end quote. Recur then comments, quote, everything, is in this as if. It is the philosophical equivalent of the myth of the fall, the rational myth of the coming to be of evil. For this coming to be is not at all an act of my arbitrary will, an act which I could do or not do. This evil is already there. It is uh, in this sense uh, that it's radical. It's in this sense that it's radical, that it's, it's it's anterior in a non-temporal way to every evil intention to every evil action, end quote. That was recurring. And so now, within the context of critical thought, we run up against the same limit reached earlier within, figurative language, within the figurative language of myths and symbols. But, recur notes, quote, this failure of reflection is not in vain. 
it succeeds in giving a proper character to a philosophy of limit. Recur specifies two limits. On the one hand, I discover the non-power of my freedom. This is a quote. Curious non-power, for I declare that I am responsible for this non-power. End quote. I become free, as it were, by declaring responsibility for a past that has shaped me more than I could ever more than I could have ever shaped it. But what is the nature of this freedom for which I claim responsibility? This leads us to the second limit. Recur writes, quote, I do not know the origin of my evil freedom. This non-knowledge of the origin is essential to the very to the very act of my confession. This non-knowledge is part of the performative of confession, or in other words, of my self-recognition and self-approbation. And so now, of course, I'm running up against my own limits. <laughs> my time. Um, let me simply end with a suggestion, one that ties my thesis to the one advanced by Michael. If freedom as a primitive data is not observable, uh, if it's not something there to be discovered, but something to which we must attest after a long process of reflection, then perhaps, and I insist on the perhaps here, then perhaps it not only comes into view, but comes into existence through an original act of affirmation that typically takes the form of a speech act. I can act. I am free because I am responsible, because I take responsibility. And of course, there's only one uh, way of ending a talk on speech acts. I am done. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Oh no, that might go on forever. That's not <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Question: um, In terms of the, it was interesting to me in terms of the performative act as a speech. I was wondering, and this might tie to something that Michael was saying: Could it actually, could confession actually be in a physical act? I think it was the original form of penance or so forth. So it's not something that's articulated, but it's, there's a manifestation through the body. Oh, through the body. Of a the non-linguistic body. form yeah. of... Right. You know, I, I, the, the, <laughs> if you're asking whether or not Recur ever envisioned such a thing, yeah, I obviously... No, yeah, yeah. The conception, the, yeah. whether it needs to be speech or kind of... I'm not sure how one would do that. I'm just not sure. I, I, one thing I, I realized about my paper after having just read it here um, <laughs> is that I didn't download it offline or anything. Um, but uh, is that the, 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 the word confession often conveys a kind of uh, uh, what, what David would call David Peller, like a form of discourse, right? I mean, it, it almost seems to convey an extended form of discourse, and that's not at all what I have in mind. I have in mind simple statements like, you know, I, I take responsibility for this, you owning up to a past in, in a very concrete kind of ordinary way. Um, the question is, though, how could you do this in a, in a non-linguistic form? I'm not sure. If you can think of an example, that would be interesting. Yeah. Oh, I see you're saying... Okay. It's just in terms of the, uh, the articulation, in terms of mm-hmm. the avowal, can the avowal, can the avowal be through an actual physical performance mm-hmm. rather than listen to a, a verbal? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I suppose if the conditions under which the action were performed were so highly determinate that it conveyed almost in the same way that speech can convey meaning, and of course not, you know, the. the I, using the word meaning here very loosely uh, to encompass even speech acts, non constitutive utterances, um, then I suppose that would be the case. That, I mean, it might be possible. It's an, inter- it's an interesting suggestion. Just in terms of the sort of reflexive, if it's an overt statement, at least you're making the affirmative vow, but it can be more cryptic, but it's you are moving with the body. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain kinds of emotional oh. responses or somatic responses. Reading really Sartre uh, talking with people Tom caught in the, in the hallway. 
uh, you know, feeling a certain kind of blush or mm -hmm. feeling a certain kind of way of seeing that is guilty. Mm -hmm. There any kind of confession in Why not? I think that's, 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 that's got to, I mean, insofar as you recognized yourself in that act, right? I mean, that's, that's part of what, that's part of what Recur seems to be suggesting here is this, is that the, um, uh, that we are agents that are, that, that are, as it were, free only insofar as we're capable of recognizing ourselves in a past. Um, I, how, I, who's, who's ever stopped at a red light and then noticed that there's a police officer behind them? and then blushed, as it were, right? I mean, behind the wheel, felt the sort of awkwardness, as if one were guilty, when one is, of course, stopped at the red light. Um, it, it really doesn't matter what the nature of that past is. That's partly, what I'm, that's partly what I think I'm suggesting. Once the primitive datum, as an observable uh, feature of inner experience, drops out, then all that we're left with is this is this is this is this uh, speech act? This affirmation that this is me, this recognition of myself in a past, um, that seems to me to be recurs, as it were, practical solution to this gap, which is an essential feature to every theoretical effort to provide an account of the will. Um, he just responds. This is how, how do you, I mean, it reminds me of, well, what's the famous story? It's a, it's a Greek story about, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of Zeno's students uh, defying Zeno's, par, uh, you know, par, one of Zeno's great paradoxes that seems to rule out the possibility of motion simply by moving back and forth. I mean, this is kind of recur, right? I mean, we can't provide a perfectly thematized rational account of, 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 of the will as a metaphysical faculty. Uh, that could be directly observable some, through some kind of inner apprehension. So what do we do? We simply affirm that we are free. We take over that freedom, in in usually in highly contextual speech acts. That's the point. Um, well, thanks for for a very precise analysis of a very important theme. Um, I think there's a very fine line between um, where you were suggesting to go further. One kind of discovering um, um, kind of what the, uh, how one's freedom is uh, operating, and seeing freedom is constituted by it. I think that's a really neurotic point, especially with regard to the uh, to, um, In the end, we, the, the argumentation wants to show that evil is only factual. And I'm not sure whether your analysis does more than that. Basically, it's Philosophically and theologically, it's really all important to be able to point out that it was only factual, basically, and not a necessity, and therefore it's kind of the, in Kantian terms, uh, the propensity and the Kant versus mm -hmm. Anlage mm -hmm. um, needs to be distinguished. And when you're saying that basically my taking over in the confession of this realization that I could have done otherwise really constitutes my freedom. I think you're, you're really uh, pushing the line there, as it were. And yeah. you're getting rid of, your end, um, of your explaining freedom away, which means you, you have to have a prior condition of familiarity with oneself in order to be able to identify oneself as the doer of evil. You seem to move it into well, the confession itself. Two things. One, I think Recur himself acknowledges that one doesn't have to have a prior familiarity with every aspect of one's existence in order to kind of take it up as part of oneself. Um, so, for example, I mean, this is partly why I pivoted away from Augustine to Kant. Uh, precisely for, for, for Kant, the, uh, the propensity, he winds up conceiving it. He, I think there's a passage in the, in the essay on Radical Evil, the first section of uh, Religion with the Boundaries of Limits, uh, within the uh, Boundaries of Reason. Uh, where he talks about uh, the, the the quasi nature, because of course he has to he has to prevent himself from tracing the the the, fr the the free act back to any form of nature. So he insists on the quasi nature. But be but this uh, this uh, maxim for the adoption of maxims. I mean, when I said principle for the adoption of principles, I was obviously channeling Kant's maxims for the uh, adoption of maxims, which is an inscrutable form. Right? This is not something which is uh, accessible to the agent. One, always, one can never be certain why one does anything on Kant's account because, of course, ultimately the, 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 uh, the one's fundamental maxims are, are, are noumenal. 
Um, freedom itself is noumenal. Freedom itself must be inferred, as it were, from our sense of moral obligation. Um, so I guess that's, that's one side of it. The other side, the other thing I would say is that, so I, I pivoted to, to Kant because for Kant, the, the free act which lies in the past is, strictly speaking, out of bounds. It's not something which can be seen. It's not something that can be observed. And so I thought this was, this was kind of the extreme case for, uh, you know, for, for this would be the extreme, uh, represent an extreme upon which one could then make this further case that evil really involves this taking on, taking over. Um, uh, but on the other hand, what I, I guess I, what, what I really want to say, and this, is, this might in some sense uh, uh, calm some of your worries, I think, is that the problem of responsibility is a practical problem, not a theoretical one. And therefore, we can't provide, as it were, a theoretical, uh, speculative solution to it that's rooted in some metaphysical theory of the will. But rather, rather the, the problem of responsibility is one that simply has to be resolved by affirming one's freedom through an act. Um, and so it, it's a practical problem that calls for a practical reply. And that's partly what I think Recurs is suggesting insofar as he emphasizes at the end of the long process of reflection, he emphasizes this originary uh, act of affirmation, attestation of self, which is not the conclusion of an argument, right? It, it comes at the end but it is, as it were, conceived of as the, the beginning. That's why it is, that, it is that kind of immediacy that we reach by way of mediation, and that there's something paradoxical about that. And affirmation of freedom is fine. I think one has to reward to, to distinguish the concrete and the formal level. When I spoke about prior familiarity with oneself, I made it in the sense of Dieter Hinrich. Uh, so it would be the formal level. So basically, it's the argument, for instance, against Habermas that we get our reflexivity from our intersubjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, Hinrich would say, no, yeah. we both have to be separated, both are co original. Yeah. So um, that's why it's not about familiarity with every aspect of one being. But I really think it's, it's an important um, point where there is a high risk of. Um, if it's the speech act that constitutes kind of my freedom, then we are back into naturalism. So that's why I think it's worth debating this. Yeah, yeah. The question for Michael Nelson would be whether this kind of primitive fact is really something else. It's not directly practical reason. It's not freedom. It's a perception. The, the, one, the one thing I would say in this, because you're right, I mean, I'm, I'm doing something with Rekirk, clearly. I'm, I'm, I, do, I do try to take him right up to the edge and then go a little further, I think, than his text would perhaps immediately allow. Um, but the one place in Rekirk, the, the, one, the one thesis that I would say Rekirk would insist on, if you were asked, is that all doing is ultimately, has its, has its, 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 its foundations in this, in this fundamental act, which takes the form of a speech act which takes the form of some kind of linguistic affirmation. Um, that, is, that, is the, that would be the root of all, of all uh, freedom, as it were. No. You don't think so? No. no. I think you have to specify the language. I think you're mixing up concrete level and formal level. Root is one of those kind of words in between. Um, I, I think philosophy of reflexivity kind of separates them more. Hmm. Uh, so, do you have time for a moment? Oh, I would just uh, uh, like to uh, uh, pay attention to uh, very heavy about taking both this phenomenology of confession, which is kind of a systematic uh, introduction in, uh, in symbolism of evil. And this, uh, I think, the, the truth question is, is, is uh, not uh, explicitly addressed, but in the last part, the dialectic. The truth question is coming into the horizon of this uh, uh, discussion. So I think if you have if you have this um, um, uh, speech act of confession and the phenomenology of confession, and you have the religious institution of the, of the confession of Augustine, I think lately in in late uh, Foucault and late Derrida, uh, Augustinian uh, conception of truth in this Christian concept, in the ritual or in the, in the confessions, has been uh, gaining a lot of attention because Foucault says this is where the 
the logics of the self is born. It's not in Socrates. It's not in the Stoicism. It's here. Mm. And Derrida says similar things. On, so I said, wonder if you were aware of this, uh, because I think it's very intriguing, very interesting what you are talking to from this uh, uh, kind of uh, types of, uh, of uh, discourse. What, what would it be like this, this maybe a new form of truth, telling truth? Mm. Maybe you have some uh, suggestions about that. I think it's very, very interesting. Ah. Especially also if you come from from Kierkegaard's uh, discourse, of the discourse, maybe that could be what is meant by making the truth, because it's a terrible reality. That's what uh, is the new uh, variation of truth that yeah. has it was in, 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 in yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, I'll take that as food for thought. I'll definitely, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm prepared to, to say anything about it here, but I definitely will reflect on that. Um, but I think you're right. There's something about, I mean, I, I think that Kierkegaard is, is in some sense an heir, uh, one of the heirs to this conception of freedom that I'm trying to give vocalization to. Um, uh, you know, and, and insofar, especially as, insofar as he's a reader of Luther. Uh, this is the freedom of a Christian, right? Which comes in the wake of a confession. Um, also in terms of speaking, and speaking without saying anything, speaking like Schleier, or speaking like uh, Kierkegaard, saying a lot of words but not saying anything because the deer down the deep, that's the deer. They, they want, I think, that's a, a deep point in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Saying a lot of things but not saying anything. I think in terms of speech acts, that would be interesting. Because yeah, yeah. Morning, we heard about the, and, uh, but nothing about confession. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Interesting.